Hello and welcome to this first exercise in uh, module 13 where we're going to be looking at uh, analysis of variance and here's the, it's called a single factor analysis of variance because the later ones that we'll get into will allow for uh, two factors and this is uh, just a completely randomized design we'll look at a couple of different designs as we go through the exercises so let's let's just get into this exercise and uh, we'll talk about different issues that might um, that might come up while you're doing this uh, as they arise in our work here so here we have uh, white tooth ink is developing an additive for its line of toothpaste that is designed to whiten teeth in as little time as possible it currently has two variations of the additive type A and B, but only wishes to produce and market one of them. In order to determine the effectiveness of these new additives, a focus group consisting of 15 people is organized. Five people are given type A, five people are given type B, and five are the control group, and they're given a placebo. So probably just a plain toothpaste without any additive in it. Each person is asked to use the toothpaste and record the time of days it takes before their teeth achieve a predetermined shade of white. So first of all, before we go through the exercise, let's just identify the different components of, of this experiment. So when we talk about uh, what is our factor, our factor of investigation, so here our factor is really just the tooth, oops, I didn't mean to cross it out, I meant to underline it, it's the toothpaste, right? We're studying toothpaste uh, as the factor. The treatments that we use, sometimes called the level of a factor, well here I have three treatments, I have a type A, a type B, uh, and I have a placebo, and where's that written down here? I have placebo here, and you can see that in the data, the way it's organized, I have three treatments. Uh, what are our experimental units, our observational units? Well, they, these are my 15 people, five in each of my treatments. So we have our experimental units are the people. And finally, what's our response variable? Or really, you can think of the response variable as being the units of measurement of your data. And so here we have uh, our, our measurements. We're recording the time of time in days, I guess not of days, the time in days before it takes their teeth to achieve this predetermined uh, shade of white. So our, our data here is measured in days. Okay, so there we've got the different pieces of our, of our experiment all laid out. Now let's go ahead and perform our test. So anytime you're doing an ANOVA study or an ANOVA analysis, you're going to be asked to fill out an ANOVA table. And so this, I've got one sort of started way down here. So I'm, I'm, I apologize, I'm gonna be scrolling up and down a few times uh, and to, to complete in this table and to perform our calculations. Because as we've said, if you've watched the intro video to this section, what we're doing here is partitioning all of the variation in this data set, we're partitioning it into its two sources. So we have the total variation, SST, which if you recall the formula looks something like this and we add this across all observations, I through NT, J through K. And we split that into SSTR plus SSE. SSTR, this is just looking across the differences between treatment means and the grand mean, plus SSE. This is just a calculation that includes only the within treatment variation. So we're just looking at the individual sample variances. So what we need to do uh, for our ANOVA table that we're gonna fill in is calculate each of these components. We'll calculate degrees of freedom. Well, not calculate, we'll determine the degrees of freedom. We'll get MSTR, MSE, because that gives us our test statistic, which is that ratio of MSTR to MSE. Then we'll find a critical value and a p-value, etc. So let's get into it. The first thing that we're gonna need here, we'll start with sum of squares treatment. So the first thing that we're gonna need is our grand mean. Now the grand mean can sometimes be, uh, a tr I don't wanna say tricky, but it can be an easy place to make a simple mistake. It's, there's different ways that we can calculate the grand mean. One, the long way is to literally just calculate the mean of that entire data set. So I have 15 observations, what's the average of those 15 observations? 
that can be a little bit time consuming, especially if you're in the middle of writing an exam and you've got time constraints. The other way uh, is to calculate a weighted average of the individual treatment means. So if I calculate, let's make sure I have room here. If I calculate our grand mean as a weighted average, so there's sample size of A times the sample mean of A and B and C and divide that by total number of observations. So this would be a weighted average uh, of those sample means. And usually this is the best way to go about calculating the grand mean, is taking a, a weighted average of the sample means. If and only if those sample sizes, oops, those sample sizes are the same, so only if the sample sizes are the same can you factor out this n. So if na is equal to nb is equal to nc, I can just factor that out. And I have what's left, my three sample means, divided by if these three sample sizes are the same, that's just three times n. And so those ends cancel out. And so here what you can see is that only in the case where our sample sizes are equal is the grand mean just going to be the mean of the means. Now I'm sort of stressing this because it's often the case that students jump straight to that calculation right away. And that's fine, it's a shortcut, but it only works in that one case where your sample sizes are the same. In our situation here, well, it happens to work, so we can use this shortcut. So when I want to calculate that grand mean, it's just going to be 5.4 plus 5.6 plus 8 divided by 3. So our grand mean, let me find my calculator here and get it out of the way, is 5.4 plus 5.6 plus 8 divided by three, so six and a third is our grand mean, 6.33. Okay, so that's what we'll be working with. Now let's go ahead and uh, set up this test. So our null, our alternative, we have three treatments, so we're testing in our null hypotheses, A and B and well, I guess our control soup, uh, control group, that can be called C for the control, that works. And our alternative is not all are equal, or at least one is different. I, either one of those two alternatives is fine. And again, just like we've been doing for every test since uh, the beginning of this, um, since beginning of module nine, I guess, we've been specifying a, a level of significance. So let's move down and here's our table that we're gonna fill in. I need to set this up with treatment, error, and total. So we've got all of our partitioning of, this is our sum of squares. This will be degrees of freedom. This will be mean squares. This will be our F statistic, our P value, and our critical F. So now let's start in this top left corner and we'll fill this in. So we need SSTR. I'll rewrite the formulas. This is NJ X bar J times our minus the grand mean squared. And we add across all treatments. So in each of our cases, our treatment sizes are the same. So that's just gonna be five times. Now here I'm gonna be working with these three sample means. So 5.4 minus always that same grand mean squared plus five. This one now is 5.6 minus 6.3 squared plus five times eight minus 6.3 squared. Okay, now let's get that calculator out again. Oh, where can I put this? I don't wanna, I don't wanna hide my calculations. Maybe right there is okay. 
Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to factor out that five. So I'm going to calculate all of the squared differences, add those together, multiply it by five at the end. So I can skip a couple of button presses here. So open so oops, let's clear this. Open the brackets. Five point four minus six point three three. Close that bracket. Squared plus open the bracket. Five point six minus 6.33 squared plus open another bracket 8 minus 6.33 squared equals and then finally times it by 5 20.93 so here's SSTR 20.93 so I come down to my table and we'll fill this in 20.93 degrees of freedom on treatment. This is K minus one. We have three treatments, type A, type B, and the control group, just as we have three means in that null hypothesis. So our treatment, our number of treatments here is three. So three minus one is two. Finally, mean squares for treatment is simply SSTR divided by, why can't I move that? Get out of the way. What's going on here? Okay, let's just work with it. 20.93 divided by 2 is 10.47. 10.47. Okay, good. We've got that done. Let's go on to the next row. Sum of squares error. So let me... Just clean up some space here. So SSE, for this formula now, we're adding again across our three treatments. This is NJ minus one times the sample variance squared. So I'll write this out. So now I'm looking at, here I've got standard deviations. So this is going to be five minus one times 1.1 squared plus 5 minus 1 times 1.5 squared plus 5 minus 1 times 1 squared. And once again, we'll get this annoying calculator that for some reason won't move. Nope, okay, I guess it'll stay there. So here's 1.1 uh, squared. I'll just, I'll factor out that 5 minus 1 again. It'll just make things easier. So 1.1 squared plus 1.5 squared plus 1 squared equals and now we multiply it by that 5 minus 1 or 4 so times this by 4 17.84 so we've got our sum of squares error 1784 degrees of freedom for, for uh, error is nt minus k nt we had 15 observations K is still 3, so this is going to be 12. And finally, our mean squared error is 17.84 divided by its degrees of freedom. 1784 divided by 12, 1.49. Good. Now, we'll as much as we've got everything we need now for our F statistic and p-value, it's always common convention to complete that ANOVA. So if we want the sum of squares total, here we can just simply use our calculator and add up SSTR and SSE. So this is going to be 20.97 plus SSE is 17.8. Is it 84? I don't know. Oops, what's happening there? 17.97 plus 17. I think it was 84. 59.78 that's not right what's going on with my calculations here oh my gosh it's clear 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 20.94 plus 17.84 equals 38.78 that's better 38.78 okay degrees of freedom nt minus 1 or 15 minus 1 is 14 
and which should also always be the sum of the degrees of freedom above it. So that's also 12 plus 2. Okay, now we can find our test or our F statistic, which is F is simply MSTR divided by MSE. So I'll get our pesky calculator that's not working for me today. And 1047 divided by 149. 1047 divided by 149. So 7.03 is our test statistic. Let's find our critical value first. So this will be alpha's 0.05. And this is from a distribution that has two degrees of freedom in the numerator, right? Two degrees of freedom on treatment and 12 degrees of freedom in the denominator that's coming from here. So now if we go to our F tables, I want two degrees of freedom in the numerator and let's see 12 degrees of freedom right at the bottom 12 degrees of freedom in the denominator so this gives us we're right in this block of numbers here here's our probabilities so there's 0.05 so that corresponds to a critical value of 3.885 so there's 3.885 now let's get our p-value. So again, we have a test statistic of 7.03. If we come back to our relevant section here, 12, 7.03, well, this is larger. It's larger than the largest value. So our p-value is gonna be smaller than the smallest value. So our p-value is gonna be something less than 0.01. So our p-value, be something less than 0 0.01. So what is our conclusion to this test? Well, we're looking at a test across means. And up until this point, it's taken a lot of students this long in the course to, to get drilled into their heads that when we're doing a, a test on equalities, your critical values are T alpha by two or Z alpha by two. Your p-values are always some probability times 2. And now, finally, once you've got all of that figured out, now it no longer applies for this type of test. Now, effectively, what we're doing for this analysis of variance is an upper-tailed f-test. So I have an f-distribution, something like this. I have, here's that critical value that corresponds with an area of alpha 0.05 in the upper tail, and that defines our rejection space. We are effectively testing a hypothesis. Now, don't ever write this. You'll probably lose marks if you ever write this. But effectively what we're testing is to see is MSTR statistically greater than MSE or not. Because if MSTR is statistically greater than MSE, then that is what gives us evidence that those treatment means are sufficiently far apart that they probably came from a different distribution, either three distributions or at least two, dis two distributions. Now, again, you'll never write this, but that's the methodology that we're using. We're doing an upper tail F test to determine whether or not this is statistically greater than this. In our case, our test statistic is somewhere way up here at seven. It's greater than our critical value. Our P value is certainly less than our level of significance. And so here we certainly have sufficient evidence to reject this null hypothesis. Which of course then brings us, that's so messy, brings us to another point is that, well, if we reject this null and we say, okay, not all of them are equal or at least one of them is different, well, that brings up the next question, which one is different? So 
this is where we will perform this Fisher's LSD. Now I'm already almost 20 minutes into this video, so I think I'll end it here. We've done enough for one video and I'll start up right where we've left off here to perform this Fisher's LSD, okay? Fisher's least significant difference. Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll end it here and we'll see you again soon. Okay, bye-bye.